Saturday morning and welcome, welcome to another episode of Exit Strategies Radio Show. I am your host, Colin J. Millett, broken owner of Exit Realty, Low Country Group, and beautiful North Charleston, South Carolina. Guys, y'all know it. Y'all heard it. Y'all hear me say it all the time, but I'm still going to let y'all know who I is and whose I am. Yeah, y'all got to catch that right there. Now, look here. We got an, uh, a, an amazing show. I, I, I kind of prepped you guys the last week or two, you know, kind of leading into this. And I'm extremely excited for this conversation that we have set um, for today. So we, we we managed, guys, to, you know, go get our, our partner, Josh Dix from the Charleston Trotting Association of Realtors, the Government Affairs Director over there, guys, to come and join us here today. So, Josh, good morning. And how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having us. Looking forward to, to chatting more about this study. Awesome. Awesome. So last couple of weeks, you know, Josh, I've kind of, you know, prepped, if you will, our our group, um, our people, if you will, our listeners um, on the housing study recently that was that was commissioned by the Charleston Trotting Association of Realtors. I believe some other organi- organizations involved. There are a lot of community partners that were part of the discussion. And I just want to bring that information to our listeners because oftentimes we don't understand what is going on in the market that causes what we see in the market. There's underlying things that happen, if that makes any sense. So if you don't mind, um, tell us, you know, why we had why the study was done. What is the study? Why the study was done and who was involved? And let's, and let's go from there. Sure. So this is something that we had been talking about for a couple of years now. We're looking at it from different angles, trying to work with our municipalities. And really what we started to find is everyone wants to point fingers. They want to talk about the need for housing, but there really hasn't been a solution oriented approach to addressing the lack of inventory that we have. Mm -hmm. So we started kicking this idea around in the late part of 2020. Um, We had the board approve the funding. We partnered with SCR and NAR through some different grants to to line up the money. And then we started just interviewing consulting agencies. And ultimately, we landed on AEG out of Chicago. Uh, Mm -hmm. They were really the, the firm that was closest aligned to what we were trying to do. They've done similar studies like this. So we worked with them all of last year to analyze not only the state of housing in Charleston, but also to look at municipal policies and how there might be barriers to entry and obstacles that we need to figure out how to overcome if we're going to start to address this. So we worked with them and then finalized that report right at the end of last year and had it ready to launch um, for our meeting in January. And so we're really excited about it. I think it lays out a lot of things that we knew, some details that were a little shocking, and Mm -hmm. then some approaches that we could take to try to slowly tick away at at some of these issues that we're dealing with. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, was very, very interesting to me as far as statistics was the jump between the first six months of 2020 and the first six months of 2021, both in the average rent amount in the Charleston area, as well as the average sales price. Can can you expound on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, just for from January 2021 to June of 2021, uh, just in that six month window, you're talking about home sales went up 12.5 percent. Rents in that six month window went up 14 percent. And so now we're looking at the median cost of a home is roughly three hundred seventy five thousand dollars. Yet wages are not going up at that pace. We are at uh, for the region, you know, fifty four thousand three hundred dollars for the average uh, income. So you're talking about most people can't qualify for the median income, uh, median housing price in the area. So that is a real showstopper in my opinion, because mm-hmm. how do we get folks into the, the housing chain? You know, we don't have entry level supply. We don't have uh, that second tier home for people to upgrade into. We just have a log jam across the board and without 
drastic income changes, you know, how can we stabilize the market to where obviously we want homes to continue to appreciate. We want that return on investment for the homeowner, but we also need to make it attainable for folks to, to get into the housing market. So we have to come at it from a couple different angles. I think a big thing that people don't realize we need to be involved in is economic development. Like how do we get those good high paying jobs into our area so people have the the income and the resources to qualify for these homes? So we are not just a residential association. Uh, economic development and commercial is a big part of what we do. And, and we try to play in both of those fields um, as equitably as we can. So, you know, a mindset, a mindset that oftentimes we encounter, you know, and, and this was a part of a conversation that you you and I um, and some of um, our, the other partners had, quote unquote, prior to um, the residential market update. Subsequently, it's an ongoing conversation that we oftentimes have this mentality, a mindset that, OK, we're here. All right. That's it. That's it. Nobody else comes in. Right. And the reality is that that is not practical. That's that's unreasonable to expect or think that, OK, I'm here. All right. Close the gate. Close the door. Let's put a chain on it. Let's not let anybody else in into, quote unquote, what is our home, our backyard, our region, whatever. And, you know, you know, you know, when you start, you know, going, going, you know, go back, you know, and in, 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 to, you know, history and how people say things, the, the dialects and things here. But some here, some some people say, look here, they, they come here and they've been here and they've been here, you know, are saying, wait a minute, I don't need you to come here. You know, so we don't want anybody else to, to come into our, our area. That is unreasonable. So, you know, you and I were just kind of sharing this conversation not too long ago that we are. And so there's an advantage in this, but I, and I'll get to that. But we are just like we're, we're I said, I believe we're San Francisco, San Diego, maybe 50 years ago and maybe New York 100 years ago. But you believe that we're going to get to that point a lot faster than that. Yeah, I think if you look at the population trends and just the policies that we have, you know, I, I think we're we're not too far away. You know, you you hit on something that triggered a thought. Everyone wants the drawbridge mentality. Um, you know, I moved here and let's pull up the bridge. But you've been here long enough. You know, I grew up in South Carolina when textiles left the state. Um, you know, when the Navy left Charleston. I still go to meetings and people talk about how horrific that experience was. Okay. And the reality is you look across the country, cities that aren't getting population, they are dying. And yes. do we want to be a healthy, robust population or do we want to be a desert? And and I, I want to be a healthy, vibrant community. I want everything to stay the quality of life that we have. And on top of that, we have very low taxes. You look at those communities where they're vacating, the way they balance the budget is by raising taxes. And so, mm -hmm. you know, w what's the happy middle? Do you, do you like low taxes and low uh, intrusion on your property or, or do you want more government intervention? So I think we have to really have a conversation within ourselves about what type of community do we want to be? Do we, you know, you talk to people who are moving here, they're leaving the high tax areas. So, yeah. you know, I, I prefer a healthy economy. Let's, let's be smart about how we're growing. I, I don't mm -hmm. want just rampant growth, but at the same time, we're, we're in a good position. And, and this is a place that most communities across the country would love to be in. So, you know, one of the things, um, that I always I, I accept. I mean, this is a, a, a pra this is a practical conversation. All right. So you either grow on or you die. There's no in between. There, there's co change is constant. So either as a community, we're either growing, which means population changes, all that kind of stuff, or we're dying. See, so you're 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 from a textile um community. Now, granted, it was textiles where I was, but I'm from the bedrock of where I'm from in South Carolina was tobacco. And you all know what happened to tobacco. So all those warehouses, all the, 
you know, that's that's where the money was made. I mean, look at that. The auctioneer <laughs> would come into town, go from this tobacco warehouse to this one, the whole crowd. I mean, I'm oh man, God, there was cars everywhere, <laughs> right? People coming to town, money being spent, restaurants, I mean, people networking. And it was interesting as I think back to watch because it gives me an understanding of how things happen now. But tobacco, quote unquote, is dead. Now, people still smoke, but it's dead. And in turn, that town, my town, my hometown now is, I mean, it's nearly desolate. There's abandoned houses boarded up all over. There's blight everywhere. No industry because everything else is as textile left you. It left us too. Mm-hmm. So now, and, and, and the problem is, is that the base, the residents aren't technical or mechanical enough to get a job working somewhere where they need to be more technical and or more mechanical. So now we have a population that really and truly in today's era have very limited opportunity. So the Charleston region is, is different. We train people, people, you know, we're trying to industry. So that makes us more vibrant, that gives better paying, higher paying jobs. But yet and still, we have obviously through supply and demand and an, an affordability issue. So how do we address what, what, what are some of the things you think we need to do to address that? Well, you know, you have a, a couple different philosophies. I really think that we have to decide what type of community do, do we want to be. You know, we have um, a land issue. We can't grow to the east of us. Um, you know, we're, we're bordered by an ocean there. Yeah. So mm-hmm. do we want to continue having sprawl, um, you know, single family, the traditional home? Or do we want to look at denser, walkable communities? You know, a big problem that people complain about when I'm at meetings are the traffic, the congestion, the stress on our network. Well, that's because people can't afford to live close to where they're working. So we really need to look regionally at these job centers. How can we get housing um, in a smaller space, uh, not square footage, but just uh, in a uh, area? Like how do we get denser communities and get folks off of the roads? I think, you know, that would be a big answer to addressing some of the issues that we're having. Um, we, Charleston was built on a walkable city. Um, that was a, a very dense community. Uh, everyone could walk to where they had to go. We had duplexes, quadplexes, a uh, different variety of home. It wasn't just your single family home. And I think we've gotten away from that. And, you know, that's a big problem of the 20th century was looking at that type of home, the American dream with the white picket fence. But that's not how a lot of these old communities were built. And and we need to really get back into that kind of diversity of our housing stock, because not everyone wants a single family home. Some people like uh, condos and that type of home, especially when you look at not only the millennials, people entering the housing market, but you look at our aging uh, membership and folks who are retired, they they want out of that 3000 square foot home and into something more manageable. So we have two um, demographics that want the same product, but we don't have that product showcase in our market. So those are the types of things that we need to, to t- start talking about zoning changes, um, allowing for a diversification, diversification of our housing inventory. Um, you know, those are the types of things that I think we have to start talking about. And, you know, this concept is what's called the missing middle. Uh, it, it's something that we've been researching the last couple of years. It's something that we are preaching to our city and county councils. And I think you're starting to see some momentum. Uh, there, there's an understanding from the planning community that this is the type of housing of the future. So, you know, it's funny because you have to look at the past to, to see how we go forward. And, and that big missing piece of our um, inventory that I think 
hopefully we'll be addressing in this next year with some zoning changes and things like that. Awesome. Well, Josh, we're going to take this quick pause right here, guys. Our listeners, if you guys would hold tight, you know how it is. We got to pay the bills right here. So we got to drop some commercials <laughs> in right here. Um, but look here, we'll be right back. Congratulations to our Realtor of the Week, none other than Christopher Williams. You can reach Chris by dialing 803-468-9332 or text K Williams, that is K-W-I-L-L-M-S to 85377. Again, to 85377. Y'all give Chris a holler now. Guys, and we're back. Second segment, Exit Strategies Radio Show. Thank you so much for joining us, for being a part of, quote unquote, the exit. Yeah, exit family. Let's just make that broad. Exit, low country <laughs> group, everything, right? So, look, we're having a, a dynamic conversation. I want to get right back into it. We have Josh Dix with us from the Charleston Trident Association of Realtors, the Government Affairs Director over there. And we're talking about, well, one, we're, we're, we're kind of expanding from um, a discussion that we opened on a house, recent housing study. So, Josh, again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to jump right back in. We're, we're kind of talking about policies and things that, that may need to be changed. So affordable housing. So let me, let me back up to this. Now, I didn't catch the, the state of the city. I haven't went to look at it yet, I'm, but I'm going to because the city of Charleston, now granted, you know, Charleston is much broader than just the city of Charleston. It's Mount Pleasant, um, you know, North Charleston, you know, other municipalities that kind of scatter around it as far as our region goes. But the mayor of the city of Charleston, Mayor Tecklenburg, love that guy. He's, you know, love him. But anyway, that's another story. Great guy. So, but he obviously he's got to, ha- it's a difficult job and he's got to have this conversation, has to make affordable housing a priority. And affordable housing has, has become the new it term, if you will. I mean, everybody has to say something about affordable housing. And there's a negative connotation. But then from a practitioner, because I've been doing this, as, uh, as relates to affordable housing. I've been doing this thing so long. I don't think I know or remember when I was doing anything necessarily different. <laughs> we we got to talk about attainability because the affordable piece is the reality. I think that the whole concept is blown. One of the challenges when you were talking about this, I wanted to make sure I got that up because we need to kind of incorporate that in. But the other thing that you were talking about is how we move people. Now, you know, I, I remember I was part of a delegation from Charleston, um, from our association a number of years ago. Um, and we went to Charlotte and looked at their light rail system. They have a great light rail system there, um, commuter rail to get people from the outskirts into downtown and into where they need to be, et cetera. Light rail in Charleston, your thoughts, how does that imp- impact housing and how does that impact housing affordability? Well, uh, you know, I think light rail would probably be the future, but you know, in the immediate near term, the low country rapid transit that the COG and uh, CARTA and, and our municipalities are partnering on, you know, that's coming next year. Um, low okay. country rapid transit, the line has been dedicated. We are working through some of the mechanics of it. Um, but you look at North Charleston, for instance, there are nine stops in the city of North Charleston uh, of 13, I believe, 13 or 15 total stops. So a majority of that chunk is happening along the Rivers Corridor in North Charleston. We went through Mayor Summey and uh, City Council. We rezoned all of Rivers Corridor to what's called transit oriented development. And that will allow development, mixed use of businesses, residents along Rivers Corridor to support that line. So that is going to be key to addressing the attainability issue that you just mentioned, but also how are we moving people? You know, that is a dedicated line from Somerville to downtown Charleston. It's estimated that it'll be a 45 minute route, including stops. So, you know, we're, we're talking about, you're not sacrificing an entire day on the bus to get from Somerville to Charleston. You know, we're, we're talking about a manageable piece of, of time that, we have now. Mm-hmm. And if we can eliminate some of those transportation costs for people, hopefully that adds to their pocketbook and allows them to, you know, start to save, build some equity, um, look at buying a home and, and 
maybe they don't want to rent forever. So low country rapid transit is, is happening 2023 that is supposed to come online and, and we're in a good position to have the right type of zoning to support the ridership. And, and I think that will start to address a lot of these concerns that we're seeing because you're absolutely right. It's not just about getting people in homes. It's how do we move them from jobs to home and back and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's, that's something that obviously in our community that, that we really, really struggle with. Um, the more people we get in, you know, I, I've, I've heard so many times uh, from people that, you know, we may be working with or, or, or with who are, who've been here. Where did all the people come from? Well, they're <laughs> moving in from other cities. Charleston's a great place to live. We touted. Everybody knows Charleston is a great place to live. So here they come, which why should we be surprised? So in turn, you know, we definitely need to look at, um, you know, ways to address that um, to help make the transition, the movement of people easier within our community. Um, to help alleviate, you know, what, and granted, our rush hour, I mean, if you've ever been in D.C., going through D.C., Virginia, uh, Maryland, um, New York, uh, anywhere else, if you will, Atlanta driving in, in quote, unquote, the hours of, you know, employ what, what was what's considered to be rush hour, man, look here, this ain't nothing. No. But, <laughs> I mean, nothing. And that stuff, look here, you can't count on the side of the road making s'mores, um, waiting for the car to move, yeah. you know? Um, but again, nonetheless, it is what where it is. And we we have to one, we gotta educate ourselves. So that's that's the piece that I really struggle with. Um, within our profession, within our industry, we gotta help the consumers and educate the consumers. So we lack at times that education within the industry. So what can we and, I, and I'm, I'm gonna get off of that because I, I, if, if you're if I'm a consumer, if I'm a you know I'm if I'm a you know mom and pop, I own you know this house, or maybe I own a business here in town, whatever it may be, I've been here. What is it that I can do to help, or what do I need to know so that I'm better prepared mentally for what is yet to come? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you talk about transportation. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here listening to you and thinking, you know, we talk a lot in politics about you can't change the outcome at the ballot box until you change the hearts and minds of the people. And I think there's a lot of that. It, that's true when you talk about transportation. Um, you know, we grew up in farming communities. We are very agrarian based and dependent on our car to get from A to B. But that's not how your major metro areas move people. And I think once we start to talk about the psychology of transportation, then we can address the, the foundation of, you know, how do we move people? And you're absolutely right. You look at these big markets, you know, trying to, to get over the Ravenel Bridge would take you 45 minutes. So, yeah. you know, we need to, and that, that's going to be a generational type of thing that we just continually talk and educate and, and try to encourage folks to, to think outside the traditional ways that, that we've moved people in South Carolina. See, see, people have gotten away from this whole, you know, some of us remember when you take a track, then go to the store. Yeah. You know, look here. I, I remember a farm. We had a little farm all, um, I, I forgot the name of the little red farmer. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. You might have had a John Deere or something over there, but we had a little farm all. You take the track sometime. You know, we you had the Alice Chalmers. The yeah, can't do that now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, now you now you need a helicopter sometimes <laughs> from one part of the town to another, or feel like you do. You know. Yeah. So you know, I, I remember that, and and I and I get it. You know, you know, we were talking, and and, I, and, and it's been a while. I've said this on this show. Um, it has been quite some time since I have said it, but I have said it here on this show because I remember coming back from um, San Francisco um, conference there, our annual, um, probably a few years ago, might have been two, three years ago, and it was pre-COVID. It had been pre-COVID. And long story short, um, you know, they were talking about the average rent 
in their in 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 San Francisco. And I recall that being like thirty three hundred, thirty five hundred dollars or something like that. And you know, there were some people in the room that there was kind of this hush, like what, like you know, the whisper, like wait a minute, what? But then there was also some people in the room that ain't, ain't say nothing, yeah, because. 3500 for 3300 or 3500 for them well that's cheap and and we 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 get away from 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 that we 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 lack the 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 we don't we don't look at other markets or other areas and 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 see what they go so our advantage i think this is an advantage for us but our advantage is that we have the ability to look at what other metro areas other cities did whether it was good or bad and then make our adjustments and learn from that whether it was again a mistake or whether it was the right thing to do and in turn we can quote unquote navigate our way better from the experience of others the key is is in education and we can't stop the growth we can't elect blunt you can't elect somebody that's going to stop growth that ain't working because every time you do growth runs up against it and then you then they got to go so it isn't going to stop so we have to look for leadership that's progressive but also consider it. That has to be a balance. Got to consider where we are, the type of life we want to have, but we also have to be forward thinking, progressive in our thoughts to try to navigate a path that will, maybe it will re meet resistance, but nonetheless navigate a path that's going to be most beneficial to our community as a whole. This is not personal. This is solely what is best for the residents for our community. So. Josh, what else do you do you have that you might want to add to um, as we look to wrap up today's show? This has been great information, but what else for our listeners? What do you think would be beneficial for them to know? I mean, I, I think we could talk about this for several sessions uh, yeah. you know, if you got more time. But, but I think, you know, just context is, is key. You know, you look at the region. We need roughly 16,000 units just in the affordable range um you know that that's a big number but if we pick off a few here a few there across the region it's it's a little more manageable when we talk about our inventory constraints you know one of the things the study highlighted was that a healthy market for us is six months of inventory mm -hmm. do you know what the number is to bring us up to 16 month or six months of inventory what's that 13,700 units we need just to, to get us at inventory levels that are healthy. And that's across all price points, not just affordable. Um, that's how far in the hole we are as far as meeting our needs in the, in the community. So we've got a long way to go, but I don't think these problems are impossible. I think you nailed it just a second ago. We have a great opportunity to look at these other markets and decide, do we want to stick our head in the sand and ignore it and hope it goes away? But you can look at that plan and it blows up in all these other communities faces. So let's get serious about these conversations. Let's work with our municipalities on better policy. And, you know, we're here in the community development business. That is what we sell is our homes and communities. And I, I think we just need to figure out what we want to look like. Um, how do we want to feel? What do we want to be to each other? Um, you know, that that's going to be the biggest obstacle is we can't draw the bridge up right behind us and, and pretend that that no one else is coming. Um, that that's just it's not sustainable. And, and it's just not the polite way to live and and we're a, a polite society so I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity here and there's a lot of growth for community building and 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 i i love policy and but that's ultimately what it comes down to is we are building communities um here at the association awesome awesome well josh thank you so much for being yes sir most importantly um you know you you are a resource um, for our association, but I count you as a personal resource and friend um, to not only me personally, but also to us here at the show. Um, so thank you so much for taking time out to delve deeper into a discussion about the impact, the impact that we need to make on our community here in the Charleston region in order to reshape or to better shape, let's put it that way. 
So for our listeners, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, guys, you know, we didn't we didn't get you a bunch of, you know, a bunch of, of breaks in there. But thank you so much for being tuned in, for listening. And most importantly, thank you for being a part of the Exit Strategies radio show family, guys. You know, I say I love you. You know how many times I say it. But I do love you. And we're going to see you guys out there in the streets.